Dear Son, I have ever had pleasure in obtaining any little anecdotes of my ancestors. You may remember the inquiries I made among the remains of my relations when you were with me in England, and the journey I undertook for that purpose. Imagining it may be equally agreeable to you to know the circumstances of my life, many of which you are yet unacquainted with, and expecting the enjoyment of a week's uninterrupted leisure in my present country retirement, I sit down to write them for you, to which I have, besides some other inducements, having emerged from the poverty and obscurity which I was born and bred, to a state of affluence and some degree of reputation in the world, and having gone so far through life with a considerable share of felicity, my posterity may like to know, as they may find some of them suitable to their own situations, and therefore fit to be imitated. That felicity, when I reflected on it, has induced me sometimes to say, that were it offered to be my choice, I should have no objection to a repetition of the same life from its beginning, only asking the advantages authors have in a second edition to correct some faults of the first. So I might, besides correcting the faults, change some sinister accidents and events of it for others more favorable. But though this were denied, I should still accept the offer, since such a repetition is not to be expected. The next thing, most like living one's life over again, seems to be a recollection of that life, and to make that recollection as durable as possible by putting it down in writing. Hereby, too, I shall indulge the inclination so natural in old men, to be talking of themselves and their own past actions, and I shall indulge it without being tiresome to others, who, through respect to age, might conceive themselves obliged to give me a hearing, since this may be read or not as any one pleases. And, lastly, I may as well confess it, since my denial of it will be believed by nobody, perhaps I shall a good deal gratify my own vanity, Indeed, I scarce ever heard or saw the introductory words, without vanity I may say. But some vain thing immediately followed. Most people dislike vanity in others, whatever share they have of it themselves. But I give it fair quarter whenever I meet it, being persuaded that it is often productive of good to the possessor, and to others that are within his sphere of action. And, therefore, in many cases, it would not be altogether absurd if a man were to thank God for his vanity among the other comforts of life. And now I speak of thanking God. I desire, with all humility, to acknowledge that I owe the mentioned happiness of my past life to His kind providence, which led me to the means I used and gave them success. My belief of this induces me to hope, though I must not presume, that the same goodness will be exercised toward me, in continuing that happiness, or enabling me to bear a fatal reverse, which I may experience as others have done, the complexion of my future fortune being known only to him in whose power it is to bless us even our afflictions. The notes one of my uncles, who had the same kind of curiosity in collecting family anecdotes, once put into my hands, furnished me with several particulars relating to our ancestors. From these notes I learned that the family had lived in the same village, Ecton, in Northamptonshire for three hundred years, and how much longer he knew not, perhaps from the time when the name of Franklin was assumed by them as a surname when others took surnames all over the kingdom. When I searched the registers at Ecton, I found an account of their births, marriages, and burials from the year 1555 only, there being no registers kept in that parish at any time preceding. By that register I perceived that I was the youngest son for five generations back. My grandfather Thomas lived at Ecton till he grew too old to follow business longer, when he went to live with his son John in Oxfordshire, with whom my father served an apprenticeship. There my grandfather died and lies buried. We saw his gravestone in 1758. His eldest son Thomas lived in the house at Ecton, and left it with the land to his only child, a daughter, who, with her husband, one Fisher, of Wellingborough, sold it to Mr. Eisted, now lord of the manor there. 
My grandfather had four sons that grew up, viz. Thomas, John, Benjamin, and Josiah. I will give you what account I can of them at this distance from my papers. You will among them find many more particulars. Thomas was bred a smith under his father, but being ingenious and encouraged in learning, as all my brothers were, by an Esquire Palmer, then the principal gentleman in that parish, he qualified himself for the business of Shrivener, became a considerable man in the county, was a chief mover of all public-spirited undertakings for the county or town of Northampton, and his own village, of which many instances were related of him. He died in 1702, January 6th, old style, just four years to a day before I was born. The account we received of his life and character from some of the old people at Acton, I remember, struck you as something extraordinary from its similarity to what you knew of mine. Had he died on the same day, you said, one might have supposed a transmigration. John was bred a dyer, I believe of woolens. Benjamin was bred a silk dyer, serving an apprenticeship at London. He was an ingenious man, I remember him well for when I was a boy he came over to my father in Boston and lived in the house with us for some years. He lived to a great age. His grandson, Samuel Franklin, now lives in Boston. He left behind him two quarto volumes, M.S., of his own poetry, consisting of little occasional pieces addressed to his friends and relations, of which the following, sent to me, is a specimen. He had formed a shorthand of his own, which he taught me, but, never practicing, I have now forgot it. I was named after this uncle, there being a particular affection between him and my father. He was very pious, a great attender of sermons of the best preachers, which he took down in his shorthand, and had with him many volumes of them. He was also much of a politician, too much, perhaps, for his station. There fell lately into my hands, in London, a collection he had made of all the principal pamphlets relating to public affairs from 1641 to 1717. Many of the volumes are wanting, as appears by the numbering, but there still remain eight volumes in folio and twenty-four in quattro and in octavo. A dealer in old books met with them, and, knowing me by my sometimes buying of him, he brought them to me. It seems my uncle must have left them here when he went to America, which was about fifty years since. This obscure family of ours was early in the Reformation, and continued Protestants through the reign of Queen Mary, when they were sometimes in danger of trouble on account of their zeal against popery. They had got an English Bible, and to conceal and secure it, it was fastened open with tapes under and within the cover of a joint stool. When my great-great-grandfather read it to his family, he turned up the joint stool upon his knees, turning over the leaves then under the tapes. One of the children stood at the door to give notice if he saw the apparitor coming, who was an officer of the spiritual court. In that case the stool was turned down again upon its feet, when the Bible remained concealed under it as before. This anecdote I had from my Uncle Benjamin. The family continued all of the Church of England till about the end of Charles II's reign, when some of the ministers that had been outed for nonconformity, holding conventicles in Northamptonshire, Benjamin and Josiah adhered to them, and so continued all their lives. The rest of the family remained with the Episcopal Church. Josiah, my father, married young, and carried his wife with three children into New England about 1682. The conventicles, having been forbidden by law, and frequently disturbed, induced some considerable men to remove to that country, and he was prevailed to accompany them. By the same wife he had four children more born there, and by a second wife ten more, in all seventeen, of which I remember thirteen sitting at one time at his table, who all grew up to be men and women, and married. I was the youngest son, and the youngest child but two, and was born in Boston, New England. My mother, the second wife, was a Bia Folger, daughter of Peter Folger, one of the first settlers of New England. I have heard that he wrote sundry, small occasional pieces, but only one of them was printed. It was written in 1675 in the homespun verse of the time and people, and addressed to those then concerned in the government there.
The whole appeared to me as written with a good deal of decent plainness and manly freedom. The six concluding lines I remember, though I have forgotten the first two of the stanza, but purport of them was that his censures proceeded from Goodwill, and therefore he would be known to be the author. Because to be a libeler, says he, I hate it with my heart, from Sherborne town where now I dwell, my name I do put here. Without offense, your real friend is Peter Fulgier. My elder brothers were all put apprentices to different trades. I was put to the grammar school at eight years of age, my father intending to devote me, as the tithe of his sons, to the service of the church. My early readiness in learning to read, which must have been very early, as I do not remember when I could not read, and the opinion of all his friends that I should certainly make a good scholar, encouraged him in this purpose of his. My Uncle Benjamin, too, approved of it, and proposed to give me all his shorthand volumes of sermons, I suppose, as a stock to set up with, if I would learn his character. I continued, however, at the grammar school not quite one year, though in that time I had risen gradually from the middle of the class of that year to be the head of it, and farther was removed into the next class above it. But my father, in the meantime, from a view of the expense of a college education, which, having so large a family he could not well afford, and the mean living many so educated were afterwards able to obtain, reasons that he gave his friends in my hearing, altered his first intention, took me from the grammar school, and sent me to a school for writing and arithmetic, kept by a then famous man, Mr. George Brownwell very successful in his profession generally, and that by mild encouraging methods. Under him I acquired fair writing pretty soon, but I failed in the arithmetic. At ten years old I was taken home to assist my father in his business, which was that of tallow chandler and soap boiler, a business he was not bred to, but had assumed on his arrival in New England, and on finding his dying trade would not maintain his family, being in little request. Accordingly, I was employed in cutting wick for the candles, filling the dipping mold and the molds for cast candles, attending the shop, etc. I disliked the trade and had strong inclination for the sea, but my father declared against it, however. I was much in and about it, learnt early to swim well, and when in a boat or canoe with other boys I was commonly allowed to govern, especially in any case of difficulty, and upon other occasions I was generally a leader among the boys, and sometimes led them into scrapes, of which I will mention one instance, as it shows an early projecting public spirit, though not then justly conducted. There was a salt marsh that bounded part of the mill pond on the edge of which, at high water, we used to stand to fish for minnows. By much trampling we had made it a mere quagmire. My proposal was to build a wharf, and I showed my comrades a large heap of stones, which were intended for a new house near the marsh, and which would well suit our purpose. Accordingly, in the evening when the workmen were gone, I assembled a number of my playfellows, and working with them diligently like so many emmets, we brought them all away and built our little wharf. The next morning the workmen were surprised at missing the stones, which were found in our wharf. Inquiry was made after the removers. We were discovered and complained of. Several of us were corrected by our fathers, and though I pleaded the usefulness of the work, mine convinced me that nothing was useful which was not honest. I think you may like to know something of his person and character. He had an excellent constitution of body, was of middle stature, but well set, and very strong. He was ingenious, could draw prettily, was skilled a little in music, and had a clear, pleasing voice, so that when he played psalm tunes on his violin and sung with all, it was extremely agreeable to hear. He had a mechanical genius, too, and on occasion was very handy in the use of other tradesmen's tools, but his great excellence lay in a sound understanding and solid judgment in prudential matters, both in private and public affairs. In the latter, indeed, he was never employed, the numerous family he had to educate, and the straightness of his circumstances keeping him close to his trade. But I remember well his being frequently visited by leading people, who consulted him for his opinion in affairs of the town, 
or of the church he belonged to, and showed a great deal of respect for his judgment and advice. At his table, he liked to have, as often as he could, some sensible friend or neighbor to converse with, and always took care to start some ingenious or useful topic for discourse. By this means, he turned our attention to what was good, just, and prudent in the conduct of life, and little or no notice was ever taken of what related to the victuals on the table. My mother had likewise an excellent constitution. She suckled all ten of her children. I never knew either my father or mother to have any sickness but that of which they died, he at eighty-nine and she at eighty-five. They lie buried together at Boston, where I some years since placed a marble over their grave with this inscription, Josiah Franklin and Abiah his wife, lie here interred. They lived together in wedlock fifty-five years, without an estate or any gainful employment, with God's blessing, they maintained a large family comfortably, and brought up thirteen children and seven grandchildren reputably. From this instance, reader, be encouraged to diligence in thy calling, and distrust not providence. He was a pious and prudent man, she a discreet and virtuous woman. Their youngest son, in filial regard to their memory, places this stone. J. F., born 1655, died 1744, A. Etat, 89. A. F., born 1667, died 1752, 95. By my rambling digressions I perceive myself to be grown old. I used to write more methodically, but one does not dress for private company as for a public ball. "'Tis perhaps only negligence. "'To return, I continued thus employed in my father's business for two years, "'that is, till I was twelve years old, "'and my brother John, who was bred to that business, "'having left my father, married, and set up for himself at Rhode Island, "'there was all appearance that I was destined to supply his place "'and become a tallow chandler.' But my dislike for the trade continuing, my father was under apprehensions that if he did not find one for me more agreeable, I should break away and get to sea, as his son Josiah had done, to his great vexation. He therefore sometimes took me to walk with him and see joiners, bricklayers, turners, braziers, etc., at their work, that he might observe my inclination. It has ever since been a pleasure to me to see good workmen handle their tools and it has been useful to me, having learnt so much by it, as to be able to do little jobs myself in my house when a workman could not readily be got, and to construct little machines for my experiments, while the intention of making the experiment was fresh and warm in my mind. My father at last fixed upon the cutler's trade, and my uncle Benjamin's son Samuel, who was bred to that business in London, being about that time established in Boston, I was sent to be with him some time on liking, but his expectations of a fee with me displeasing my father, I was taken home again. 